All right, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for uh, joining us tonight for our second and or third community, third community forum uh, regarding the Tingsboro Middle School Building Project. Um, we are using the microphones so we can have a good quality audio tape so we can put this on our website as well as get it on the, the district page and the town page uh, for rebroadcast. So uh, we do thank you for taking your time tonight. Uh, for those of you who don't know, my name is Dr. Flanagan. I'm the superintendent of schools here. Uh, very proud of the work that we've done to get to this point, and it's been an incredible amount of work. Uh, this work started, for those of you who don't know, a little history lesson, in 2011. In 2011, we submitted our first statement of interest to the Massachusetts School Building Authority to seek their support and to get into the pipeline to have their help as we look at building a new middle school. To submit a statement of interest to the MSBA, you have to have support of both your school committee and your board of selectmen. So from 2011 to 2019, we had eight consecutive years of unanimous votes by both the board of selectmen and the school committee, 96 to nothing by our elected officials that recognize the need for a new middle school. So we were finally accepted in 2019 and very proud to say that we've done an extensive amount of work since 2019 to get to where we are today. And we are finally getting to the point, we're getting very close to the point where it comes back to the community for a final vote to move forward or not. Uh, have some great community members here. Uh, if we go to the next slide, please. As I said, this truly has been a community partnership, Board of Selectmen, School Committee, and the School Building Committee. The School Building Committee is made up of familiar faces from the Board of Selectmen, from the School Committee, from the community, from the schools. Uh, it's been a, a very uh, long process, but it's been a great process. And it's been a process that has really provided voice to a lot of stakeholders in our town. Um, very happy to have left field here before us tonight, as well as JCJ Architectures. They are the experts, they are the professionals, and they're gonna show you the work that's been done, and they're gonna answer any question you have along the way. Uh, certainly construction is not my forte, so I, I'm so happy that we have this group here with us tonight. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Jim LaPosta from JCJ Architecture. He's the team up front, and we'll go from there. Okay, Thanks, Jim. thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Jim LaPosta. I'm a principal with JCJ Architecture, and we are Absolutely delighted to be working with you to try to, to figure out the best the best path forward here and to, to get a new a new Tingsboro Middle School. So here's our agenda tonight. I just wanted to go over it with you so you can kind of see where we are and we're, we'll answer whatever questions you may have. So we're going to talk a little bit about the MSBA process. I'm going to spend a lot of the evening pulling this back up over my nose. I do apologize, but I think everybody has got that by now. The MSBA process, uh, where we are in the timeline. So we'll, we'll review what's happened already. And we'll talk about the things that, that have to happen in the future to, to make the project, uh, to, to get to the point where the community can make a decision about the project. Um, and we'll give you an update on where the design is. We'll talk a little bit about all the options that were looked at, and there were very, very many, how the decisions were made to get to the option that's moving forward, and then kind of where, where that is right now. We're still kind of early in the design stages. So why don't we, I think, that, and then of course we'll answer questions. Next slide, I think, has the team. Uh, so the team, uh, the professional team, is made up largely of two organizations. And this is also prescribed not just by the MSBA, but, but by Commonwealth law. Um, any project over $5 million, I think it is, uh, an owner's project manager needs to be retained. That's left field, and I'll let David introduce himself and his team. Okay. All right, third time. David Sandin, Project Executive, Left Field. And we have Hamdi Chonobo um, in the audience taking meeting, meeting minutes. Uh, they're, they're brought on first, and they really are your, your guides through this whole process. They are the liaisons with the MSBA. They, they work with us uh, and the building committee, and really will be here start to finish to kind of guide you through this process. We're the second ones on board as the professional practice. And then underneath us, there are, I've lost track, but somewhere probably about a dozen sub-consultants of engineers and various disciplines who've been working with us and will continue. I think it's around a dozen, maybe it's, it's more, but something like that. 
So uh, again, I'm Jim LaPasta, I'm the principal on the project, and we'll start here with Lauren. Hi, my name's Lauren Brerin, I'm the project architect and designer. And I'm Doug Roberts, the project manager. Jim, we have about 28 consultants on the 28 team. consultants, that's why you're the project manager and I'm not. Um, then there are other members of the team who will be at these meetings uh, other times. Emily Zarnecki, who is our lead interior designer, will be and is working on furniture. Uh, Eric uh, from our Boston office, who's the project architect, who will be ultimately putting the construction drawings together if the project moves forward. And some of you may have met David Stephen at, at the previous uh, workshops. David is an architect and an educator and worked with the district to help create the educational plan, which is the foundation for this entire project. The MSBA insists that, that every project begin with an educational plan. So it's about what the kids need and about what, this, what the, the district and the people in the district want for the kids, not just about a building. So everything, everything that happens with the building uh, will be in response to what the educational plan needs are in terms of the size of spaces, the type of spaces, and the things that are being taught. So why don't we go to the next slide. Um, as the superintendent pointed out, this process has been going on a long time. Um, but just since February of, of 2020, um, when, uh, when the Board of Directors invited the district uh, to conduct a feasibility study, which is really the first big milestone um, step, there's been 41 public meetings, and this is now our third forum. So there's been quite a few, quite a few meetings going on. Go to the next slide. This is a simplified view of the process where we are. Um, the MSBA is a very organized and systematic uh, group, uh, systematic uh, process. We, we do work in other states, and I can say by far Massachusetts has the, the best organized um, school construction program, bar none, that we've, we've run into. So where we are right now uh, is we are up there, oh, I love that, up in schematic design. They call them modules. So eligibility is where you started. Module two is where we all got hired. Um, module three was the first thing we did, which was the feasibility study. That was to look at every option you could look at. That was to look at, and we'll go over these in a few minutes, but that was everything from just a, a minor renovation to this building to a brand new building and an addition and renovation. So that was to uncover uh, as many possibilities as possible um, and then narrow it down to the one that made the most sense educationally, financially, and for the, for the community through the vote of the school building committee. Um, that then gets reviewed. Every step in this, in this uh, process gets reviewed by the MSBA in Boston. Uh, they ask a lot of questions. We go to a lot of meetings, the, the school superintendent, our team, and it gets thoroughly vetted and the board of directors approves a direction based on how well that direction um, matches up with the plan as presented and whether it makes sense relative to what other communities are doing, broadly speaking. Um, so that happened between feasibility and schematic design. We're now in what's called schematic design. And that's looking at the kind of the overall design of the building. How big is it? How many rooms are there? What's it going to look like on the outside? It's not the details you would build it from, but it's a very detailed uh, set of documents that ultimately also comes along with um, budgets and uh, cost estimates. And there's a series of cost estimates that are done all along the way, multiple times by our office and by an independent cost estimator, by two independent cost estimators that get matched just to make sure we all have a good sense of where we stand from a budget perspective to make sure the money is being used wisely. So that's where we, that's where we are today. We're gonna to bring you up to speed on, on where we are. Um, from here on out, the next steps, I think David's gonna talk about later if I'm correct. Um, go to the next slide, yeah. Um, so this is a little, bit, a little bit more detail of what I just was talking about. So you can see that you are here um, a lot of uh, going all the way back to 2011, as the superintendent talked about, a lot of things have happened. So really, the UR here means we need to finish schematic design, get this package to the MSBA for review and approval, and then ultimately get to the point where you put the question back to the community about whether they want to move forward based on this particular plan. And we'll talk a little bit more in detail about that. You can go to the next slide. So where did the project start? I mentioned uh, the educational plan. Through a series of workshops earlier in the year with educators, um, with community members, uh, some of you may have, many of you, I think, participated. Um, David Stephen, the educational consultant, led a, a 
programming effort to come up with not just, a, not just an educational plan, but a set of guiding principles that really tried to encapsulate the aspirations for the district and, and, and what that meant architecturally. So these, these broad categories are the things that, we've, that were approved, that we've been working with through the, through the process. So it's about personalization and connection, making sure there's a sense of ownership for kids in the school. Create, um, creative and visible learning. So there's things happening that get kids excited and interested about learning. Making sure the building supports collaboration and cooperation, which is really the way we all, the way we all work and learn. Um, setting up the building so that it creates lifelong learners. So when the kids leave here, um, they have a love of learning and they're gonna continue that through, through, their, through their lives. Uh, because this building needs to be a 50 year building, that's an MSBA requirement. So whatever you do, needs to, needs to uh, have a lifespan of at least 50 years for the majority of the building. That means the building has to be adaptable and evolve over time. Um, we know what's going to happen now. We can, we can have a pretty good idea of what's going to happen over the next five years. But I doubt that any of us in this room know what education will look like in 30 years. So we need to make sure that the building can adapt over time or do our best to, to allow for that. Again, that makes it a good long-term investment for the community. And then speaking of investment, making sure the school's a community resource. So you can do things like this, have community meetings, use the gymnasium, use spaces in the school without having to open the entire building to make sure that you can, you can use the building really all the time, right? And make sure that it's a, it's a, a building that when, you're, when you invest in it, it's used as much as you possibly can use it because that's going to make it the best long-term investment for the community. Next slide. Thanks. As Jim mentioned, uh, early in the project, we were in feasibility study. That was module three. And the task there are two major miles of uh, deliverables to MSBA. First is the preliminary design program. That's where we work with the guiding principles and the visioning that is articulated by the staff, the community, as to what you want to see in your school so we can put numbers to it so we have the right size school for your program. Everything's aligned to your educational space program. In addition to that, we're tasked with exploring the available sites in the community to test fit whether or not that program would fit on those sites. As Dr. Flanagan mentioned, when the statement of interest was submitted to MSBA, only the middle school, high school campus was approved by MSBA. As part of the committee's due diligence, they tasked us with finding alternative sites in the community so they could really test and vet what the opportunities might be. Across the top, you'll see that there are seven different sites or different configurations that were just, uh, reviewed. Uh, the first is, as Jim mentioned earlier, MSBA is very prescriptive. They wanted us to explore a code upgrade to this building here. And it's bringing everything up to today's modern building code as well as accessibility codes. So we had to test fit that. The challenge with working within this building, it doesn't support the educational program. So it's an exercise making sure that we do our due diligence and trying to preserve the community resource and best fit it to that educational program as opposed to creating the right building for the community. We then looked at additional renovations for the existing middle school. We looked at schemes that um, preserve the existing gymnasium and the central office space below. And then we also looked at um, uh, schemes that would then uh, grow into the softball field area. What we discovered there is if we tried to reuse the gymnasium, we actually had a very inefficient building. We had preliminary uh, cost estimates and we found that based on square foot costs, that was the most expensive option. So we weren't really serving justice to the community by having an expensive building that was very inefficient when we we're actually trying to save cost. Then we looked at new builds. Again, one of the sites that was considered was the elementary school. So for a host of reasons there, namely busing, additional operational costs over that 50 year life of that facility, that wasn't the best solution for the community. We then turned to options here on the campus, high school, middle school campus, one in the front parking lot, one in the baseball field behind the high school, and then ultimately the one in the softball field. We presented these, this information to the school building committee. We developed criteria that first start with the educational plan, cost and schedule, uh, community resource, 
and then building the site considerations. And each committee member had the chance to weigh and vote on each of the options. Next slide, please. So in the, in the end, MSBA requires that we advance the code upgrade. We also then looked at what were the next two highest scores, because we want to evaluate at a minimum of three different options. You can see based on the scores, it was the code upgrade, addition renovation into the uh, softball field, uh, preserving the gymnasium building, and then the softball field. New build. David, do you want to speak to this? Okay. Thank you, Doug. Um, so when we did the, the scoring, as you can see a couple slides earlier, um, we obviously tallied all of the ranking. And uh, what's important with this slide is that 87% of the building committee um, uh, voted in unison that the best location, not necessarily the option yet, but the best location was to put it uh, on the softball field. Um, so, it, it, you know, well, you can see that um, they might not have been consensus on, on every um, evaluation criteria. The location of where to put the preferred solution was the softball field. So once we submitted the preferred design program to MSBA, we then proceeded with preferred schematic design. That's where we looked in greater detail and explored three options that were recommended by the school building committee for further exploration. And from those, we created variations on the theme. And you can see at the top there, we had a total of six different options that were considered. For consistency, we had the same categories to evaluate those six options that we did at PDP. And in the end, uh, you can see how we distilled from seven down to six, what we were calling option D213, uh, which was a new build, new construction in the softball field, scored the highest. Go to the next slide. Again, we were responsible for identifying pros and cons or advantages and disadvantages for each one of those schemes. First and foremost, the advantage of this particular option is it does support the educational program. It had a two-story hotter the school. That was one of the visioning concepts that was universally embraced by both the faculty and the community. And it provided distinct community and school entrances so that you could have simultaneous use. It becomes a community resource. In addition, we wanted to make sure that there was education on display. That was something that was critical. Right now, we want to celebrate the education that's going on here and enhancement of your existing Tiger Plaza. Strong connection from the parking, the campus, and the sports field behind. Um, it, there are some site issues that need to be addressed in terms of truck uh, deliveries on the campus, as well as bus drop-off and parent queuing. So we had to address that with this facility. In addition, um, this multi-phase construction that didn't require any swing space. The advantage of that is it helps preserve the dollars, construction dollars that go into the actual build, so your students in the community realize the benefit, as opposed to paying for swing space, the MSBA does not deem its eligible costs. That'd be out of the town's pocket. Oh, we'll go back if you could. A couple of the disadvantages uh, from a construction standpoint, and again, reducing the overall construction schedule, controlling cost. It was agreed that central office would have to relocate off campus during construction so that we can raise the existing gym and use that area for a safer building site. And then, secondly, the uh, Absent of the gym during construction, there would have to be scheduling uh, coordination to use the high school gym as a resource for the middle school. All very manageable and in conversations with the districts to uh, make that happen. Next slide. So from a construction standpoint, uh, the multi-phases would include first raising of the existing gymnasium in the uh, elevated connector between the classroom building and the gym. Phase two would be the construction of the new building in its entirety. Phase three would be the demolition of the existing classroom building itself. And phase four would be completing the site. And when Warren gets into the schematic design description, she'll start talking about the site amenities that we propose. Thank you, Doug. 
So as Doug just indicated, as far as the phasing and the logic of the phasing, uh, uh, as far as the timeline with the proposed construction schedule, town approvals would occur in May of next year, 22. Uh, the completion of the design and construction documents will then continue. Uh, in the spring of 2023, we're anticipating starting uh, phase one of the abatement and demolition of the gym uh, central office. In parallel to that, the construction of the new school would occur. This has a 24 month timeline with FF&E and tech deployment, which would be happening in early spring of 2025. The goal would be to do an April move. Uh, and then once the April move uh, occurs, they'd be abatement demolition of the existing school. The goal would be to complete the project within the calendar year of 2025. However, I do not think we're going to hit the planting seasons and um, I think the project will um, creep a little bit into the spring of 2026, but uh, the sooner we can get the project completed, um, the, the more um, you're able to preserve funding for the project. Um, so speed is key, um, and the goal would be to have it complete within the calendar year 25. But this will be developed further as we uh, continue into schematic design. Mentioned earlier, we wanted to make sure we had the right size school for Tingsboro. Uh, MSBA, as part of their due diligence, creates a baseline template space program that tries to encompass common core uh, program areas that's common to all districts, but they also recognize that each district is unique in terms of how they deliver their education and what courses they offer their student. So it's a baseline that is always added to. So what we wanted to highlight here is the unique aspects of the um, Tingsboro Middle School program is going to require that we have more core academic classrooms than would be in the baseline template for MSBA. What that allows you to do is have two teams of four per each grade. It's uh, team teaching that is uh, at the core of the middle school uh, delivery and something that is planned for the 480 student school, which is more than you currently have, but it's planned for the future. In addition, special education, there are a number of areas that, uh, again, based on unique program, we had to have the appropriate spaces. In the right-hand column, you can't read it, but that those items that are in green were added for unique for the program. Those that are red are part of the baseline template that the committee decided you didn't need. So there's some horse training, if you will, to manage the square footage. Art and music. Uh, one aspect of this project that was uh, came out of the visioning is a need for a, for a flexible performance space. So again, viewing this project as a campus amenity or a facility, this is a space that can serve not only your middle school students, but also your high school students. Uh, and last is the uh, Health and physical education. The size gym is a full size gymnasium. MSBA pays for the court. What they don't pay for are the bleachers. And there's also a health classroom in there as well. And then lastly, the bottom line other. Because it is a campus, there are district resources on campus that we want to preserve here. Uh, it's the central office and district IT. So as you can see, using the MSBA template, doesn't account for any of your unique spaces. We are roughly at about 108, uh, 112,800 square foot building. Okay. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I need to get closer to be able to see anyway. So. The, this is our current um, landscaping site plan. It's it's really zoomed in. Um, you, I have a better view later that includes the entire site. But this is um, starting to talk about some of those um, educational guiding principles that Jim presented earlier that came out of those visioning workshops. Um, the concept of the campus was very big. You know, high school and middle school on the same campus is very unique. It's something we want to take advantage of and celebrate. Um, and Tiger Plaza in particular was something that we focused in on very early on in design um, to enhance that, to make it something that is a, a space that the students can share both between the high school and the middle school. It's a community experience, um, that, that walk from the parking lots out to the fields, that procession out to the, the field areas. Uh, so how can we create 
and, and enhance the space that's already there now that it'll be in between these two buildings which are much more closely located. So these are some initial concepts of outdoor learning areas. During COVID there's been quite a bit of outdoor learning that's happening. It's, it's certainly something that um, wants to be incorporated more and more into the academics here. Um, so the there are some more, we, we call it quote unquote urban space in that area, so more hard surface in the Tiger Plaza area, whereas in the core area that you see in the center of the building, um, uh, David will hover, yeah, there you go. Um, the courtyard in between the classroom wings is a little bit more um, green space. There are still hardscape areas out there for outdoor classroom, um, but also the concept of an amphitheater, an outdoor amphitheater, so really taking the, the strong pr uh, performance and arts programs that you have here at the school and taking it outside too um, and making that also an additional community resource. Uh, next slide, please. So here's an aerial view. I'm flying over Norris Road in this image, or we are. Um, and so we're looking down towards the, the campus and to the left you see the existing high school. Um, and then the new middle school is, is on that, that existing softball field. In this image, this is when the project is complete. So the, the existing middle school has been demolished at this point. A new parking lot has been constructed in its place. And to the south of that is a new softball field, um, which is mostly in the area where the existing middle school parking is, um, but a little bit beyond that as well. Um, the existing drop-off that happens today, so when, when cars enter the site and buses um, on Norris Road, thanks David, um, and they take that left, uh, that, that is all intended to be retained, the existing drop-off for the most part. Um, as you get closer to the high school, um, the Tiger Plaza area, that's been, that radius has been changed slightly um, to make it a little bit easier and closer to the entrance to the middle school, which is pretty much where David's cursor is now. So the new middle school entrance for students being dropped off would be where David's cursor is, which kind of nicely flanks Tiger Plaza with the high school entry on the opposite side. So the, the, the whole idea of security, um, first and foremost, is that when people enter the site, they know where they're supposed to go. Um, and if they're not going where they're supposed to go is very obvious. So um, having that, that entry there and visible is, is very important. Um, the uh, the next, next uh, concept here is that idea of community entry that we talked about, but also uh, the district office's entry. So that is off to the side here, yep, right where David's cursor is. Um, so during the day, that, that um, band of space there that runs parallel to that <laughs> is the, are the district offices. Um, so they could have their own parking area there, their own door, even though they're still part of the middle school building, they are segregated um, so that visitors could come in without breaching any security into the middle school. Um, so those two functions can still continue to happen. Um, and then to the, the Beyond that, um, in the center, the, the, the two-story section that you see, yep, David's hovering over the gymnasium, um, and beyond that is the cafetorium. Um, those are those community spaces, the community resources we want to keep available all day, all night, and on weekends, um, and, and be able to do that in a way where we don't have the public accessing classroom areas, so the classroom wings were designed very specifically to be able to be locked down um, for that access. Um, and then towards the rear of the building are the two classroom wings. I'll get into more detail about that later, but the, the form of them is intentional, um, that kind of opening up and having views toward the fields and towards the courtyard was, is all by design to really enhance the experience from within those classrooms um, and have them frame that view out towards the fields. So next slide. So here's our floor plan. Uh, again, we'll highlight the, the main entry for the middle school is here. And that has a direct connection straight through um, to the cafetorium, and which, which um, Doug talked about earlier, the heart of the school. Um, the idea of the heart of the school was really important um, that came out of those visioning meetings. It's a two-story space. Um, we have some views of it later, but um, the, two, the two classroom neighborhood wings are two stories each. And so having that connection of the second floor um, students and classrooms to the first floor, it really happens in that heart of the school. Um, so that, that connection is there. Um, going back to the main entry to the left, the spaces in purple are the administrative offices with eyes on the street, literally, um, being able to control access um, and, and watching the comings and goings of all students and visitors. 
Um, the other thing at that entrance, that's where uh, middle school and high school students could move back and forth between the two buildings under, under secure um, access. Um, as we move around, there's the uh, nurse's office is included in that admin area as well as guidance. And then the spaces that you see to the left in that first neighborhood uh, is the STEAM neighborhood. So that's STEM, arts, uh, media arts, um, and computer science are in this wing. Um, and then there's an outdoor classroom, which you can see um, dotted into the left at the, at the closest to the high school on Tiger Plaza. Um, that area would be developed into an outdoor classroom that's actually undercover, um, so it's shielded from the weather. <clears throat> As you move further into the building, uh, you see the gymnasium, sorry, on the right-hand side in the, in the blue, that's with the bleachers that, that Doug mentioned earlier. Beyond that are locker rooms, uh, and then beyond that, District IT is actually right on the, the, um, the heart of the school, um, so that they're there to, to help the students and be accessible to them, um, but also close close by the district offices. And then the cafetorium space uh, is a is the, the area where the cursor is now. That's the seating area that can be converted into um, the audience area for performances. And then to the right is the stage, which has an operable acoustic wall to separate it so that during the day, or most of the time, um, it would be a music classroom. So it's multi-purpose. It's not just a stage, it's also music. Beyond that, behind that is the band room. Um, which can be used for um, green room space or backstage space um, uh, during performances, but um, most of the school day it is, it is the band room dedicated. Um, <clears throat> the, the kitchen is to the north, there you go. Um, and there is a, a service area there with a loading dock so that deliveries can be made. Um, and that was a big piece of the site development that Doug mentioned earlier is being able to receive deliveries at the middle school so that they had their own receiving area similar to what the, the high school has um, and trying to keep that a little bit out of sight so it wasn't front and center when deliveries are being made and the public is, is coming in. Thank you, David. <laughs> um, and then to the north, the angled wing is um, one of the classroom neighborhoods. So um, the grades six, seven, and eight, each one has a neighborhood. They're all identical. Um, and they are all centered around what we call the heart of the neighborhood. So it's a, <clears throat> it's a scaled down version of, of the concept of the heart of the school, which is that cafetorium uh, black box um, media centers um, area in the center. Um, it's, it's an area where there is some teacher collaboration space, there's breakout space for the students, um, some special ed spaces uh, there, toilet rooms so that the, the spaces that are shared by the entire neighborhood are all centralized. And then to each side of that is that, that team of four that Doug talked about, a science classroom and three general classrooms, as well as a foreign language room and a couple of special ed spaces as well. So go to the second floor, please. <clears throat> so on the second floor, you can see the other two classroom neighborhoods that stack neatly above the, the first floor neighborhoods connected by a bridge that runs through that heart of the neighbor, uh, heart of the school. So that bridge can actually double as a catwalk for the cafetorium space um, during performances, uh, but it's a, it's a, we have a view of that later. Uh, it's a really nice overlook um, looking through that space. And then to the left of that is a, a stair, an open stair that's, that connects the two floors. Uh, it also has some bleacher type seating in it for a bit of a learning stair. It can also be expanded seating for performances. And that, that entire wall is as much glass as possible to look out towards that courtyard space and look beyond um, towards the fields and the, the forest. Next slide. So this is a zoomed in view of that cafetorium in cafeteria mode. Um, we, because the stage is elevated, we've, we've actually sunk in that. So there's some ramps and stairs that head down into that area to really um, form that connection. Um, and then the, the kitchen then is at the level of the serving area where the, the seating is. And that allows us to have the stage and music at great at the um, level of the band room and uh, make the movement of instruments and pianos back and forth a lot easier um, and, and make that much more <coughs> useful. Um, to the left, I forgot to mention earlier, so the, the Doug mentioned, um, and so did Jim, the black box with the flexible performance space. So because there isn't a auditorium in the new school, um, in the sense of this type of an auditorium, the space that 
has been created is a flexible performance space. So it can be set up many different ways. It can be done as theater in the round. It can be used for meetings like this. It can be used as an extra classroom. At times, um, entire teams could meet in there. Um, it, it currently has a capacity of 180 seats, which happens to be how many seats there are in this room. Um, the back half of that seating is actually bleacher style, so it could be folded up against the wall, so it gives you more capacity with the flexibility of opening up that space. And across the hall from that, the other blue space is the Library Media Center. Um, the library here is a little bit um, different than other districts in that it's distributed um, and it's, um, it's open to the students to kind of come and go. Um, so making that also as flexible as possible so that it can be reconfigured easily, everything inside of it can be moved. Um, lots of technology in that space and having it at the heart of the school so it's as useful and accessible to as many people as possible was also a big piece of the planning. Okay, next. Oh, here's the cafetorium in, in um, <clears throat> excuse me, performance mode. So that accommodates 220 seats in the chairs that are folded there. That does not include anything beyond that. So you see some other tables um, out towards the glass wall and some of that bleacher seating beyond where the stair is that, that brings you up to the next level. Next slide. I just want to oh. comment uh, in terms of the MSBA guidelines, uh, why we are opting to the cafetorium solution is MSBA will not reimburse for an auditorium in a middle school. So again, if we were to provide a space just like this in the middle school, the uh, uh, entire cost would be borne by the community. So we're trying to, again, build in flexible spaces that have multiple utility and uh, accommodate your educational plan. So here's a view, um, under, standing under the bridge, looking towards the stage, this is in performance mode. Um, so you can see in the distance, the, the uh, operable wall between the stage and the cafetorium is partially open. Um, to the left is the servery. To the right, is a is what we call the loggia. It's that corridor that's slightly elevated, so it's at the height of the stage in the band room, um, just slightly above. So we could they could actually have um, cafeteria seating there. It could be something that you aspire to earn to sit there, um, but also additional seating during performances with a slightly different view. Uh, next slide looks the other way. So in this image, you're looking back t out the the uh, glass wall towards the courtyard. You can see the bridge passing through. Yep, thanks, David. Um, and then to the to the right, you see the communicating stair that brings students up and down from the, the second level. Um, and that that concept of the bleacher the bleacher stair next to that, so students could sit there and hang out, have their lunch, do some studying. Next slide. So this is a um, a view looking into a typical classroom neighborhood. Um, so. At the center of the neighborhood is the heart of the neighborhood. Um, and so that area is shared by all students in this grade. Um, and then to the area that's um, closest to the center along the outside wall, if you could highlight that, the um, teacher collaboration area. And that's, that's for a few things. It's about accessibility. It's also about observation. So making sure there's eyes, eyes on the street against um, teachers being able to observe students, making sure that they're doing what they're supposed to do in that space, um, but, but, but also being accessible to those students when they're needed. Um, and it, we've shown a few different um, furniture configurations there. It's all very flexible and movable. Um, <clears throat> there's the, t the toilet rooms are there. So that is all shared space. Um, and then adjacent to that are, are the um, special education classroom to the right, um, the, the foreign language classroom to the left. Those are also shared resources. Um, to the back side of the is the special ed resource room. Um, and then on either side of that are the science labs. So the science labs are sort of the core of each of the teams. And then um, around those are three general classrooms. So that's your team of four um, on each side. And it, the intention is that there's a, they're identical. Um, the, the prep rooms, the, the layouts of the science labs are as identical as possible. So, every, so it's interchangeable um, for all three grades. So that gives them a lot of flexibility to be able to absorb those bubble classes, those enrollment um, bumps, um, to be able to, to move, move students around, uh, move grades around within the school. Next slide. 
So this is a view looking at that um, heart of the neighborhood. So you can see that teacher collaboration area is what's highlighted in the red here um, with some accent color. Um, you can see that movable furniture. On the lower level, there would be a direct connection to an outdoor classroom that's in the courtyard space. So that's what that glass wall is. Thanks, Dave. Um, and then to the right, um, we were building in lockers, um, heading down towards the heart of the neighbor or heart of the team. Next slide. And this is the same view looking at the steam neighborhood. Um, the steam neighborhood, as I said, has the um, art classroom, uh, computer science. The STEM room is actually divided into two. It's more of the the maker side and then the um, the 3D printing side um, with visibility between the two. Uh, opposite side of the cor corridor is the media arts lab. Um, and it's really, the, the, having them clustered around the heart of this neighborhood is really about that collaboration between these different, um, these different classes uh, as much as possible. And then um, heading back towards the main corridor is the uh, bridges space. So that is a, a special education classroom that's a little bit more Sensitive being near the nurse is important. It has um, all of its toileting and things built within it um, and some life skills elements as well. Um, so having that as close to the, the nurse and the front door as possible was, was desirable as part of the program. Next. This is a view of the heart of the neighborhood for STEAM. It's a little bit different. There's a little bit more visibility from like the computer lab and the art room into this space. You, you can see a little bit more glass so you can see through into other classrooms. Um, but other than that, the same co teacher collaboration concept and that connection to the outdoors built in here. Next. Thanks, Lauren. In addition to being tasked with designing a building that not only meets your educational program, we also want to make sure that we are providing the community a cost-effective, um, responsible solution for sustainability. As you can see at the top, we have conducted two echo charrettes with our consultant, BVS Architects, who lead the committee and represented members from the community in discussion about achieving the LEED certification. The building committee is uh, desiring to acquire two additional points of reimbursement from MSBA. The threshold to achieve that is LEED certified. Um, of that, you're required to have at least 40 to 49 points that are approved or yes in the yes category. In the different categories that are listed there, the location, transportation, sustainable sites, water efficiency, energy and atmosphere, materials resources, indoor environmental quality, innovation, and regional priority. You can see the scorecard on the left. There, it's very prescriptive. There are very detailed uh, descriptions for each one of those line items or credits. So what we do is we talk about each one of them, how they tie into the overall design, and what's the reasonable way of approaching those so that they're uh, cost effective and also hit the sustainable target. So each one of the categories, you'll see there are either yes credits, which we know that we can achieve with great certainty, the low hanging fruits without a real, uh, real impact to the project. Uh, from a cost standpoint, uh, maybe plus, there's an opportunity there, but as we get more detailed information in the design, we'll have a better understanding of whether or not we can achieve those points. Maybe minus, it'd be a stretch, right? We, it's out there, there's some benefits to the project, but in terms of cost, we have to manage that with the other demands of the project. And then there's some categories that we definitely know at this point where we are in the design, we can't even touch those points. So as we go through and develop more detailed information on the projects, have a better understanding on the building systems, um, more detailed information on the building envelope, how the building's going to perform, we then will evaluate and adjust those points. Uh, as you can see, the second generation, anything that's identified in the green is where we actually enhance those points. We increase them from the initial pass back in April. Those that are in red, we actually have to reduce that number. So right now we are tracking in a very strong position where we are in schematic design to achieve that LEED certified uh, certification. Um, if we push beyond that, uh, 50 points is when you cross the threshold into LEED Silver. Again, that's not the goal of the committee, but if we can achieve it, we will. But it's information that we'll take back to them to make an evaluation determination if we want to pursue those points and understand the cost benefit to that.
Thank you, Doug. I get to talk about the fun stuff, the money. Um, as you can see, I have disclaimers on, on uh, my slides. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the probable cost of the project. And uh, let me just say the probable cost was done at a point in time at the preferred schematic report. So it was done months ago. Uh, we're in the schematic design process, so these numbers will fluctuate. Um, but again, at that point in time, we did a probable cost analysis. It came out to $81.8 million. Um, the uh, composition is over here, $65.6 million for construction, a little over $12 million for soft costs. We have contingencies, the total cost, 81.8. We did an analysis of what the maximum MSBA grant amount would be, which is $28.9 million. I'm going to get into that in further detail in the next couple of slides with the estimated district share at 52.9 million. There's a couple um, costs here that I want you to just remember. $351 per square foot, that is for the building cost. That's what I call, a lot of times I call it the cost to build the box. Then there's the cost of, uh, the cost per square foot for construction, all inclusive, the site, the demo, the abatement. That's at 583. Um, but again, these numbers are subject to change as we continue to progress through schematic design. <clears throat> at the time when we did the probable cost analysis, uh, we were involved in um, an elementary school a couple of towns away um, that, that recently passed, uh, passed about a year ago, and um, actually about six months ago, excuse me. So I had some data that I already had collected and now granted, these are all elementary school projects, and these are all, the analysis here was the average elementary school project within the MSBA pipeline averages around $584 a square foot for, for construction costs. At our point in time, for the probable cost, we were at 583 So we were right in line. But again, this analysis is not apples to apples because every project has its own story. It might have more site work, it might have more abatement, um, but this is just a, um, a benchmark in a way to look at. But this benchmark, which is the cost of the building only, the box, the average elementary school project in, in the MSBA pipeline is averaging around 372. We're around 351 when we did the probable cost analysis. Then I ended up doing an analysis with middle school projects. Uh, and again, we're on the low side. Um, it, it's always, you, you never want to be the most expensive project in the MSBA pipeline. I want to talk a little bit about state reimbursement and understanding. And, and please, if, if there's uh, uh, takeaways tonight, um, I hope everyone remembers that uh, we came up with a very thorough um, uh, educational plan, educational scope. Um, the building is the appropriate size to deliver on that education. Um, it's not the Taj Mahal. Uh, the design is very efficient. The cost per square foot is very efficient. Uh, and then for the reimbursement rate, the reimbursement rate is 58.01, the forecasted reimbursement rate. I'm going to round to 58. But remember, the reimbursement rate is applied to eligible costs only and not every cost is eligible. A lot of times what communities think is that they take the reimbursement rate and they apply it to the total project, the total project cost. That's not the case. It's applied to eligible costs only. So um, the analysis that I performed at the point in time, uh, 32 million is uh, ineligible costs. So the um, breakdown is 81.8 million for the probable costs, 32 million is ineligible. So the probable cost that the MSBA will participate in is 49.8 million. When you apply the rate to it, uh, eventually the MSBA will pledge 28.9 million roughly um, for the community and then the, the district share will end up being roughly 52.9. Um, but again, these numbers will change as we continue into schematic design. I want to talk a little bit about the MSBA failed vote policy. 
Uh, I know a lot of communities, they've been building schools for years, but uh, the MSBA came into existence in uh, the end of 04, really the beginning of 05. And uh, I always tell communities it's a new sheriff in town. The MSBA took over the SBA, which was the School Building Assistance Program. Um, and I know in the past, a lot of communities, they'd um, develop a project, they'd go to town vote, it'd fail, they'd go again, it'd fail, and then they'd go again, it finally passed. And along the way, the design morphed in a way to get it to pass. Uh, with the MSBA, um, it's, it's your one bite at the apple. And as uh, Dr. Flanagan indicated at the beginning of the presentation, it was either eight or nine years where uh, every year uh, there was a statement of interest, an SOI submitted to the MSBA, and then finally uh, your number came up and you were invited into the pipeline, and here we are. So if the project does fail, we have about 10 business days to get back to the MSBA to say, what's the game plan? Um, and if the project does fail, um, you, you're, you go pretty much to the end of the line. And I've done an analysis for other projects we've done. Um, we haven't been involved in these projects, but they are projects that have failed. Uh, Granbury, Carver, Hopkinton, Lincoln, Orange, Swampscott, the list goes on. Uh, some of these projects um, take many, many years to, to come back around the second time. Swampscott, I have to update this, they, um, they, they got approved the second time around, but it took them eight years and uh, their project recently just passed. Uh, Amherst, I think, just got invited in, and so did Lynn. Uh, some towns, uh, they fail, and um, they never got invited back into the MSBA. They ended up doing it on their own with no reimbursement from the state. So on average, if a project fails, by the time you get back into the pipeline, it could be anywhere from eight to nine years. And when you get back in, you're starting from scratch. It's a whole new feasibility study. So I know the town appropriated $950,000 to do this feasibility study. Um, that, in a, in a way, would be wiped out. You'd have to start over and do another feasibility study once, if you're lucky enough, to get voted back into, uh, into the pipeline. So high level, um, where we've been, what we've done, where we are, where we're going. Um, you know, we, we really got traction at uh, the beginning of 2021. We've completed the preliminary design program. This is where James, at the beginning of uh, the presentation, indicated we, we turned over every stone. We looked at every option that was possible. Um, then we narrowed it down to the preferred schematic report. We did analysis on the shortlist. Uh, we ended up settling the best location and the option was at the softball field. We got the MSBA's approval on the educational plan, the size of the building, the square footage, the program. Uh, we started into schematic. We're going to be dialing in the interiors, proprietary items, estimating, reconciling, and developing the project budget from a finalized standpoint. Submittal to the MSBA in the beginning of March, a thorough MSBA review. Um, the MSBA approval will happen on the 27th of April. And then we have town approvals May 3rd for town meeting and May 17th for the debt exclusion vote. Upcoming building committee meetings, we typically meet twice a month, the first and third Wednesday of every month. Um, we're not going to be meeting, um, uh, obviously, the week of Thanksgiving, but our next meetings in December is uh, December 1st and the 17th. We have a slew of meetings scheduled for um, uh, 2022 from January right up until town meeting. Uh, please visit the town's meeting calendar for the actual dates and times. Uh, typically, we always start at 630. We're going to have another community meeting sometime in the early winter, um, probably January or February. Um, and for additional information to keep in touch, stay in touch, visit our project website, which is on the screen. And uh, I don't know, Dr. Flanagan, any closing remarks? Oh, I saw major. I love a microphone. Um, so, so I hope you can get a sense of uh, the amount of time and effort that went into this, the amount of work that's gone into this. Um, I think 
from the get-go, and, and, and they haven't done a great enough job of, of selling it, but they've heard the message loud and clear. We want the best educational product we can deliver for our community in the most fiscally responsible way. And I think, as you saw the comparisons with like districts, uh, they've done that. They've done a phenomenal job. It's been a pleasure working with this group. So at this point, I turn to Phil Donahue, and we're happy to answer any questions you have, and I'll run around with the microphone to make sure the appropriate person addresses any concerns, questions, or clarifications you'd like at this point. Anybody that anything? Yes. What's not reimbursable? Of the, thir of the $32 million, what's not reimbursable? Great, thank you. So the slide that we have up here, um, obviously, there's a very thorough analysis. Um, you know, I, I joke, there's a reason why I pay an accountant to do my taxes. But, uh, you know, I end up, I, I, I fill out all the forms to, um, to the MSBA. I understand uh, how these work, what's eligible, what's ineligible. But from a summary standpoint, this is the project budget. You'll see the number right uh, here. There's the 81 point. $8 million, and again, these numbers are subject to change. This is the excluded and ineligibility column. This is where it totals $32 million. So we have some costs that are just categorically ineligible that are related to um, services that we provide, that JCJ provides, and there's 20, uh, around $28 million of just construction that's ineligible. The reason why is the MSBA puts a cap they just put a cap per square footage. So this ineligibility is not an anomaly here. This is across the Commonwealth. So, you know, I could do an analysis on every other school project that is in the MSBA pipeline. It's going to be the same news. Their, their, their reimbursement rate might be 50, but their net reimbursement, once you put into the equation, probably goes from 50 to 30. It's it, it just that's the way it works. Um, so there's an ineligibility on uh, a cap with construction. Uh, they do not pay for flooring abatement. There's a site work cap, uh, ceiling abatement too, that's, that's new. Um, and uh, then when you take those costs, then obviously they apply a markup on those costs. Um, there's also uh, a cap for fixtures, furniture, and equipment. The MSBA allows $2,400 for uh, technology and furniture per student. Um, you really cannot furnish a school for $2,400 per student. It just can't be done. Um, so I hope that somewhat answers 8% yep, site work costs. So there's some um, just triggers that the MSBA you know, um, has within their system um, that determines the ineligibility. And again, this is not just at Tingsboro. This is every project in the Commonwealth. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. So the green space area, so why, why are we building, why are we replacing the softball field uh, outside? I mean, I can answer that. It's simply because we're constructing on a current softball field. So MSBA, correct me if I'm wrong, supports the, the repurposing or the, the uh, construction of something that is taken down or, or they did. So because we're constructing on technically the softball field right up here, we can replace that out there. That's why that was determined. No, the current softball field right here with the backstop that overlooks Pierce Field. Also known as the Desert, also known as a, a lot of other names. I started coaching here in 1997, so it's had a lot of names. Any other questions? Great, thank you for that question. Yes, yeah, so the current enrollment right now at Tingsboro Middle School is about 395 students. Chris, ball, ballpark, 395 students. Um, we did a longitudinal study approved by the MSBA 
that looks at our enrollment over the next 10 years, which projects student enrollment to go up to 480 students. So as we talk about 50-year buildings, we talk about forward thinking, we talk about building two teams of four, which you've heard. We used to have two teams of four, but given our current enrollment right now, we have a team of four and a team of two. Um, so we need to prepare for two teams of four, which is where our enrollment will go. Um, and again, I go back to the fact that in 2001, another history lesson here, this community made a decision that we want to have a middle school model. And that was something that we adopted. And actually, the current commissioner of education, Jeff Riley, was our first middle school principal. And that's something that we foundationally believe in. And that came out loud and clear in our educational plan as we developed that plan. So we fundamentally believe in the middle school model, and we need to prepare for that uh, as we think 10 years out when the enrollment goes back to 480 students. No, we're having a hard time with 395 in some of these, in some of these classrooms. We really are. And you see kids in the halls every day. Just no room to, no flexible learning space in the classroom, no room to collaborate, no room to get together. So they're in the hallways uh, with their laptops on the ground. So, yes? Sure. Sure. Right. Great question. I'm just going to reiterate for the camera. Uh, so essentially right now the question, if I'm, if I'm right, is how do we communicate to those who aren't familiar with the middle school some of the limitations of the middle school, some of the classrooms, what the environment really truly is like here. And I think we have, uh, we have done some informational videos in the past to get that out there. I know that there is a group of parents coming together to kind of spearhead initiative and, and kind of get the message out there as well. So certainly that's part of the intent as well. If there's a fine line between what the school building committee uh, can put out there. We need to put out their factual information. You know, our, our job is not to sway a, a vote. Our job is to say this is what the, the construction will look like. This is what the cost is. But there is another group that I, I've heard that's looking for information to uh, promote uh, the need promote the need for middle school and really uh, outline what, what goes on here. So uh, we are working in that. Uh, we can uh, certainly make some of our old videos and information uh, available to anyone who would like to see it. And I think that was information that we put out when we uh, were going for a feasibility study as well. And uh, actually information we sent to the MSBA as well with our statement of interest. So. Yes, Chris. Sure. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. So our original statement of interest, well, our last statement of interest, not the original one, the last statement of interest really is a comprehensive document, and that is available on our middle school webpage. Uh, so that information is available there. Um, it might be a nice link that somebody could put out there on social media so they could have easy access to it as well. But everything that we've done, everything we have is available on our middle school webpage. Yes? 1968. The school was built in 1968. I would, I don't know. I, I really can't answer that question. Um, you know, this was the original Tingsboro High School, and then it became the North Road Elementary School, and it became Tingsboro Middle School. Um, so this this building has taken a lot of different forms over the years. Um, I don't know. And again, as you heard, you heard the, other, the other thing you heard tonight was, you know, as you think about our high school 1992, our elementary school 2002, those were pre-MSBA. That was SBA. When the MSBA came in, and you heard this loud and clear, that they changed the expectations and formula, which is why we get one bite at the apple right now. For those of who were around in 1998, 99, when we were voting in the elementary school, that had three votes. That doesn't happen. That cannot happen. There's one vote. Um, so it's a very different process. So I'm not sure what the requirements were for life expectancy during, for the SBA, but with the MSBA, we know that's 50 years. Anything else? Well, I can't thank you all enough for coming tonight. We really do appreciate it. Uh, we hope you've got a lot of information. We've got a lot of questions answered. As we said, this video presentation will be available uh, on our webpage on the middle school site. 
And uh, again, if we can get the message out there, if uh, you need any information, questions, please feel free to send me an email. Happy to get back to you. Thank you very much.